Hello everyone, and uh, welcome back to our Microsoft Flight Simulator Evolution of Aircraft Design. We have made it to the post-war general aviation boom of the 1950s. Also, Rocket Robin, tweet, tweet, tweet. Yes, I did make the elevators, and actually our rudder vators uh, do that together. So at this particular period, we saw a rapid growth of general aviation planes. It wasn't just a couple planes that all look like the basically Piper Cub ripoffs. They started changing and getting different shapes and uh, more aerodynamic shapes and we started seeing a lot of air-cooled engines that were boxer style as opposed to um, bay radials especially and it was a big big change uh, the other thing we saw is how aircraft interiors started to get even more standardized and more comfortable especially for us and you can take a look real quickly how squishy this is and i'm just getting an idea this aircraft here of course is a beechcraft bonanza this is the v35 uh, you can go ahead and tell because uh, we've got one of those in the back big old v-tail somebody thought that that was a good idea. And when you look at the instruments, you finally are starting to see the presence of the standard six-pack instruments. Uh, we didn't have a lot of this. Keep in mind, a lot of these instruments were added after this aircraft came out, so we're doing the best we can with what we have. You get my feels. But we have a lot of things in this airplane. Uh, one thing you'll notice, of course, we wouldn't have had this. Uh, that, that would not exist in the 50s, but that's okay. But you would, of course, have had an autopilot, and uh, you would have your standard six-packs. We have standardized uh, instrument arcs now. You're going to notice the presence of large instruments. You're going to notice that how we started to collect everything into one place to make it easier to read and understand. You started getting gas temperature Ages, your radio started getting standardized. Ignore this. You would not have had this. This hadn't been invented yet. We barely had space flight at that point. Of course, you also see a couple other things. Uh, you'll notice we have the presence of circuit breakers as opposed to fuses, uh, which we had an enormous amount of. Uh, you also notice we have a couple other fun little things here. And uh, when you come down here, you will see that we have quite a bit of work when it comes to our fuel system. It started to change. We also have the presence of cow flaps, uh, which uh, we had quite a bit of. And again, I'm going to push those suckers open, even though we're at relatively high altitude here. Sorry, pull these suckers open. So our engine instruments got much simpler to physically operate. Uh, they're just handles. I squeeze them and pull them. You'll notice the presence of little tools here that make it when I pull them I have to actually push the button in in order to adjust them making them much safer our mixture control is the same way we're actually a little leaned out right now if you're wondering about that it has to do with the altitude you'll notice we have things like panel lighting uh, we have the ability to basically control all of our temperature controls very easily right in front of us the also thing you probably notice is we have a standardized key system now and when we think about keys uh, aircraft this is basically what we have today for general aviation of course there's other exceptions we also have a yaw damper or uh, something that uh, we may or may not have had depending on what version we had other things we started to get we started getting hsis that had tools that would actually go ahead and lock onto our compass what these would actually do is you could read the compass electrically and update your directional gyro automatically so we didn't have to do that for ourselves we also started seeing the presence of vor NDB navigation. Uh, we had Loran at this point, which was impressive. Uh, we also saw initial inertial navigation, but not for us in GA land. Uh, that won't ever really happen for us in GA land, but it does come eventually. Other things you're probably going to notice is our aircraft design has shifted slightly. Uh, one thing you'll notice here is uh, we're nice and really well sealed up. Uh, you don't have just things where they just slam it in there. You know, this glass is in there. Uh, you'll also notice that we're starting to get much, much better flush revenue here. You also see the presence of anti-static wicks for instrument flying. You'll see that we have little tiny tabs and you'll notice oh what's this piece of metal that seems to defect into the slipstream to improve my air flow aha uh -huh, flap yes we even have flaps at this particular point from a passenger perspective, we've got new creature comforts too. I can come back here. I have my own little reading lights. Uh, you'll notice the presence of, uh, hmm, I wonder what that's for, a <laughs> drink holder. I actually can put my foot here, um, not very well, but a little bit. Uh, we can see over the wings. And of course, our aerodynamic improvements have been very, very substantial over the years as well. Again, things are getting a little more teardrop shape. But I'm going to start stop describing and uh, start flying because that's what I do. Now, my first encounter in the real world, of course, with a Beechcraft Bonanza, and keep in mind, this is a later model of an earlier model of a later model kind of a thing like that is getting the impression of just how large the airplane is. These are really, really big planes, and uh, it would really, really surprise you uh, when you see one of these kind of up front, just to get an idea of just how much larger it is compared to like a Cessna 172 or something like that. Of course, I'm actively changing the mixture as I'm taking off here because I'm up, up so high. I think that's about the correct mixture setting. You know, there it goes. There we go. Now we can get some altitude. There it is. Cool. So you'll notice, even though I'm a general aviation plane, I can go like that. And I can actually put my landing gear up. Oh, that's kind of a nice little innovation. You'll see the doors close up, making it nice and flush and giving us really, really high performance. Now, the thing you probably notice here is my yoke has gotten so much more complicated, but you also notice the presence of a trim button on the yoke. 
I know that sounds like um, I'm making that sound way more exciting than it is, but that was something we simply did not have very often, especially in general aviation planes. And again, I recognize this is the, not the 1950 exact version, but it's the same idea. You also notice things like propeller heating. You'll notice the presence of an alternator for electrical generation. You'll notice they've given us a couple little handy dandy things over here to make our life a little bit simpler. I don't know where that just went a second ago. It was kind of weird. You'll notice that we're nice and sealed and we have some soundproofing. You'll also notice we have the ability to do things like plug our headphones in, uh, something that uh, we didn't have a lot of. You can see I can actually stick a pair of headphones in there and hear things uh, while I'm flying and actually maintain a little bit of my hearing. Uh, of course, our trim's gotten more aggressive. I can reach over and press a button and the aircraft flies itself. Uh, something we did not have much of up until a little bit later on when some of this technology got a little bit better. And again, it's just incredible to think that 50 years have passed and this is what we have now. Now we have a couple other innovations. So we have things like ELTs, which we wouldn't have had at the time. Uh, we have the ability to go ahead and select different radio stations. Again, this is a much more modern radio set than would have existed in the original one. All my stuff is right in front of me. I have tools that will indicate my flap setting. I don't have to look out the window for that. All those things are now built in for the convenience of the pilot rather than basically having to go to war with it. We also have the presence of enunciator panels. I noticed we didn't have a lot of that back in the day. And of course, we have these very, very closely cowled engines that uh, that's why we've got the cow flaps so deflected all the way. And you also notice the large trailing antennas. Uh, we're starting to eliminate those and replace those with much, much simpler antennas and VOR receivers. And even we started to get the beginning of instrument landing systems so we can land a really, really poor visibility weather. And all these things basically came out back to back and suddenly became Came available for the civilian market. Now, there's another airplane that came out in the 50s, which probably doesn't need introduction. Oh, what's this? A Cessna 172. Of course, uh, this Cessna 172 is a much later model than the one that we would have had in the 1950s. The one we would have had in the 50s would have been much, much more similar to the uh, one we saw earlier, the Cessna 170. But here it is, the Cessna 172, 1956, the most produced aircraft in the history of airplanes. And when it comes to airplanes, I think everybody's flown one of these and they didn't even realize it. Maybe they flew it in their sleep, I don't know. But this represents a huge change evolutionary. Uh, first of all, you'll notice just like the Bonanza, we now are using landomatic landing gear, also known as conventional, the tricycle landing gear as opposed to conventional or tail dragger. Another thing you'll notice, of course, is uh, we have a completely sealed, and there's my cheeky co-pilot. Seriously? Show off. Um, one of the things you'll notice, of course, is um, we're getting much, much bigger standardization. You'll notice the visibility for the pilot is much, much better than it was in the past. Um, that window in the back, by the way, in the Cessna 172A, we wouldn't have had that window. We also would have had uh, 40 less horsepower to give you an idea of how that's changed. Our six-pack instruments are more or less standardized now. And again, keep in mind, this is a much improved version of the Cessna of that era, but it still has the same general idea. Naturally, you wouldn't have had a GPS or anything along those lines. You definitely wouldn't have had an automatic pilot. But the controls, the Vernier style, were basically standard in a Notice, of course, we have nothing to worry about as far as cow flaps. We have the good old-fashioned pitch trim, which is uh, readily accessible. Again, it's just kind of sitting right there to make our life a little bit easier in the event that uh, we need to quickly go ahead and make adjustments to that. The other thing you'll notice, again, I don't know why they crank my lights up. We've got our circuit breakers, which are pretty standard. Again, the Cessna 172A is going to have a slightly different. We also have that standard bag needle layout. Now, the Cessna, like I said, 172, doesn't really need a lot of introduction, but it also starts to represent sort of what we think of as kind of modern general aviation. You know, this is a very simple to fly aircraft. It's just effective enough that you can use it for uh, kind of getting around if you have a relatively small and lightweight family, but it's also good enough for training purposes. You know, those landing gear are built. I know they say it's only three Gs, but let's be realistic, folks. Everybody who did flight training knows it's a uh, probably more than that or a lot more of these planes would have been spooched <laughs> but again everybody uh, knows the specific seeds uh, right away it's hard to say that sometimes specific speeds there you go and of course what we have things is our good old-fashioned 76 our 66 our 56 all easy to memorize the handling on these airplanes are very very simplified the volume's a little excessive uh, for those of you who are not experienced especially the early model ones they're very very angry planes but again Everything we think of as kind of like a standard uh, general aviation plane really started at about this point, you know, between Beechcraft, of course, we have Piper, we have a couple of the companies as well. You have Grumman uh, making like their Tigers and stuff like that a couple of years later. But this is sort of what you got. Uh, you know, World War II had ended, a couple of years had passed, you finally got settled in your career. You're like, I'm ready for an airplane. You pay $2.50 an hour for a flight lesson. 
And these would be the kind of planes that you would fly. And notice the presence of flaps. Notice we have very, very good riveting here. Uh, notice the presence of huge ailerons. Notice that the aircraft engine is canted, uh, which actually makes it easier to climb. I don't have to use nearly as much right foot to compensate for things like P-factor and you know all that other nastiness that usually comes with climbing here. Uh, the other thing we're starting to get to, and again, we wouldn't have had this on the A model, I won't say that again, is the presence of things like CDIs, ADFs, NDBs. All that stuff would be all standard equipment for us, which makes it much, much, much safer. They'd actually make a night flying pack for this plane that would come with lights. Uh, we also have alternators. Uh, we have other creature comforts like heat, <laughs> little things like that, where it's like, oh, that could probably be helpful. Um, I do make comments every once in a while about the presence of these little guys here, but they weren't necessarily there on the plane that you would have flown at the era. When it comes to handling, when I compare this to the Blario uh, number 11 there, this thing is a vacation. I just push the nose over, I back the throttle up a tiny bit like that. I just tap the trim button about two or three times and we're good to go. That's it. That, 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 that's it. We're, we're just cruising. And again, we can tolerate turbulence. Uh, we can tolerate, uh, you know, if we go down to the utility category. We can get almost five Gs out of this thing if we wanted to. I don't recommend that, but you could. We're also starting to see aircraft with much, much better range. You know, I can basically go hundreds of miles in this plane, even the older versions of it. Of course, the uh, later versions, actually, they started putting fuel all the way out into the edges of the wingtips here, which gave you even more range, assuming you had the weight for it, which a lot of times you didn't. And this design, even though it's a pretty much the same design as it was when it came out in 1956 all the way through today. And the latest models, really a lot of it is comfort and electronics. Uh, that's kind of where the progress for this plane was. But its overall form factor and a lot of its kind of handling and stuff, yes, the earlier models were lighter and a little bit like, um, I don't know, what's the best way to describe it? Uh, more brute force. Um, even the modern versions of these had some really, really, really good innovations on it. And again, it's sort of like, what do you like? Do you want something light and touchy or do you want something that's just kind of solid, which is what you get with the later variations? So as we can see in the 50s, um, things are starting to look a little bit more familiar. We're recognizing airplanes. The technology looks basically the same stuff we have today. Actually, the engines are pretty much the same ones we have today. So what happens when we get to the 60s? Uh, that's something you're going to have to see on the next episode of Microsoft Flight Simulator Evolution of Aircraft Design.